Um, well, welcome. Like I said, I'm Emily P. Freeman, and I am an author of four books. My most recent release is Simply Tuesday. This is the book we've been talking about. Um, for those of you joining us from encourage.me, encourage with an I, welcome, welcome. It's been so fun to kind of follow along your journey and um, several hundred of you, I think there's over 700 maybe in the Facebook group for the book club, um, have joined us every week. And I know some of you are just watching the Periscopes, but I just want to quickly say thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for, for tuning in on these Tuesday scopes. It's been so much fun for me. We have one left. Um, and so I'm just, I'm really thankful and it's been super fun to have you guys here. Thank you for joining us. Um, well, this week we are in our Hustle Free Book Club. It's kind of hard to say fast. Hustle Free Book Club. Um, we are talking about uh, our soul. And it's funny because, um, you know, this book is all about learning to release our obsession with building our lives and trusting instead in the life that Christ is building within us. But where is he doing that? And he does it on our, in our everyday lives, on our everyday Tuesdays. But where does that happen? Well, I believe it happens on the level of our soul. And so, well, what, what's our soul? And it's a great question. Someone asked me last week, definition of a soul. So today, um, in our short time that we have together and not to get too theological because, oh my goodness, um, on a periscope at lunchtime on the East coast. But basically, um, I just want to share with you my sort of, um, own definition of the soul that I've learned over a lot of years of study and kind of thinking through it all. Um, I've done, read a lot about it and written a lot about it. So I'll share with you that. And I also want to share with you um, three phrases that your soul doesn't understand. Yours doesn't and mine doesn't. So, um, but real quickly, just to jump right in. So our soul, I think we all would agree that we uh, are at least a two-part human, right? We know that we have our body, the part that you can see, and we also know that we have the part that you can't see. So it's the part you can see, it's the part you can't see. Um, and so our body is the way that we interact with the world, super important. Um, I think that we would also all agree that we have an invisible part. There's an, a visible part of me and there's an invisible part of me. But the debates come and the confusion often comes when we start to be, when we begin to kind of try to uncover and explain, well, what is the invisible part made up of? And what does that even mean? Give us some hearts if you kind of have had that question, like, okay, there's, there's an invisible and then there's a visible. I see lots of hearts. Like there's sort of, how do we even define that? So my attempt here today, just in a couple of minutes, is to give us some words um, to define that invisible part. Um, so like I said, I, uh, we know there's visible and invisible. Body is how we interact with the world. When it comes to the invisible level of our soul, um, here's what I've come to believe. And this is kind of a working definition and I'm learning as I go and I'm I know that we, there is a mysterious, incomprehensible God, so I don't think that humanity can really be defined and broken apart this way. But um, to help us in conversation, one way that I have found that really helps me define is um, I think about the, our, our, the humanity as actually a three-part whole. There's our body, there's our soul, and there's also our spirit. And sometimes when we hear the word soul, I think a lot of people use soul and spirit really interchangeably, and maybe that's okay. Um, I know on my blog, Chatting at the Sky, I talk about um, how I long to create space for your soul to breathe. And maybe uh, somewhat, maybe somewhat for us that is confusing or whatever that is, but really um, our body is how we relate with the world. Our spirit is how we relate to God. If you think about when it says in the Bible that we have been made new, well, what's been made new? Well, my spirit has been made new. It's where I connect with God. And so that leaves our soul. So my soul really, if it helps to think about it, um, helps me to think about my soul being made up of three parts. It's our mind, the thoughts that we think, uh, my emotions, the things that I feel, and our will or my will, uh, the decisions that I make. So our mind, our will, and emotions. And that's sort of what makes up the soul. Um, hold please while I just, there we go. Uh, so we think about, we've got our body and our soul and our spirit. So what I talk about in this chapter is really sort of um, between the soul and the spirit. I'm, I'm Sometimes I'll maybe talk about spirit and soul. I think it gets confusing if I try to define each one every time. But um, just for our own purposes here, let's talk about that soul, our mind, our will, and emotions. It's where we, we think, we feel, and we choose. It's that invisible place. I think we all know that um, that, that exists. It's sometimes hard to explain. But I think it's when the Bible talks about that we have been made new in our spirit, 
and we are being renewed day by day on the level of our soul. And so our soul is sort of where the sanctification happens. It's sort of where I learn and I grow and it's how I can change. It's where sometimes I might, I might sin, but then I might not and I can make choices to do that and make decisions. Um, and so, uh, but on the level of my soul, my spirit, that's where Christ lives with me. And I think he, he lives in a place that is, uh, that is connected with him in a way that can't be broken. But our soul, we can sort of experience uh, others or we can be connected with our spirit in that way. So I hope that, that that's not too awfully confusing. Mind, will, and emotions, the level of our soul. And so when we talk about the language of the soul, well, I think there are some things that I say to my soul uh, and my spirit and just myself that is, uh, I think there are some things that I say that my soul doesn't understand. And I'm going to share with you three of them. There's probably a whole lot, but I just want to share three for today. And uh, one of them is this. Stop being so needy all the time. I tell myself that sometimes. I feel like I need to be independent and I need to like figure this out and I need to make this decision and it needs to make a lot of sense. And why am I feeling so needy? Um, anybody ever feel like they're a little bit too needy? <laughs> and like they wish that you could just stop being so needy and just get it together already. Well, when we tell our soul, stop being so needy, it's almost like we're telling ourselves, stop being who you are. Because the truth is in Christ, we were made to be needy. We we're made to depend on him. And so um, I really believe that our soul, I think of it, I tend to think of it kind of like a circle. And it's our soul isn't this straight up and down thing, but a circle that wraps around something, wraps around the center of Christ, that Christ is at the center. We're, we're made to worship, we're made to be needy. And so instead of saying, stop being so needy all the time, what might it look like to ask, to actually pay attention to that need and ask in the presence of Christ, what do I actually need right now? What decisions am I needing to make? Where am I needing to feel secure? Where do I need to sense some belonging? And sit in the presence of Christ with that question. Um, so if you try to tell your soul, stop being so needy all the time, she's not gonna understand that. So let's stop saying it. Second, one thing I tell my soul, one phrase my soul doesn't understand, another one is hurry up. My parents got a puppy a few years back when they got their first puppy and they named her Deli and they were trying to potty train her and one way they tried to potty train her is they would go outside and when she would be used, trying to use the bathroom they would say hurry up Deli hurry up and it was sort of her little trigger like her little doggy trigger to like use the bathroom and relax well um, I think sometimes I say to my soul hurry up Emily hurry up hurry up soul hurry up and heal hurry up and get it together hurry up and make everyone understand you hurry up and and move past the hurt hurry up and hustle and um i think that my soul doesn't respond to hurry up uh in fact i know that it doesn't and i'm and i know that yours doesn't either when we try to rush our decisions and rush our uh you know our souls in a way that we're not meant to be rushed um for me it makes me unable to make a decision it causes me to um it causes me to feel uninspired. It's sort of like I can't, I can't make a decision. Um, I don't feel creative. I can't connect with others because I'm trying to hurry through things rather than sitting in the presence of Christ and accepting his pace for my life. Soul doesn't understand. Stop being so needy all the time. Soul doesn't understand. Hurry up. And the last one that our soul doesn't understand, one of many, but the last one I'll end with here is grow up. Why don't you just grow up? You're supposed to be mature. You're supposed to know stuff. Um, so just go ahead and grow up. Well, this one is one that I wrestle with because sometimes I feel like I still struggle with things I struggled with in third grade. Um, but when you think about the things that we're afraid of, um, you know, I'm afraid of rejection. I'm afraid of uh uh, looking dumb. Some of you might, maybe we could put just one word in the comments here, some stuff that maybe you're afraid of. Just when you say like, what do you fear? What's the thing that you would say? You can just pop it in the comments there. Um, I'm afraid of looking foolish. I'm afraid of going first oftentimes. And yeah, we see some of the comments, I'm afraid of looking dumb, rejection, failure, being disliked. You know, when I look at these things that we're afraid of, making mistakes, looking stupid, um, they're really not so different from the things that I was afraid of when I was uh, 10. And so to say that my soul needs to grow up is to deny uh, my childlikeness in the presence of God. Um, one of my favorite quotes, and I think I used it in Simply Tuesday, and I will share it again with you now because I think it's so lovely, 
was said by Wes Stafford, who I had the privilege of traveling with to Uganda last year with Compassion. And, and Wes, for many years, was the president of Compassion International. Um, and he said, uh, he, he was talking about Jesus in the Bible, and he said, Jesus never tells uh, children to grow up, but he often tells grown-ups to become like little children. And it's not because Jesus didn't like grown-ups, of course not. But I think uh, the reason why Jesus never told uh, children to grow up is because he is deeply interested in the person behind the persona. And when I am trying to act like a grown-up, sorry, I have something here. When I am trying to act too much like a grown-up, when I'm trying to be in control, manage outcomes, and, and be the one who knows all the things, I am putting on a persona and then I am not really being my true person. And so instead of, um, of, of trying to tell my soul, you need to grow up, you need to get it together, um, what might it look like to, as Wes Stafford so, so beautifully put, become like a little child in Christ's presence? Because the truth is that's what we are. It's such a relief, that's what we are. One uh, of my favorite stories when we went to Uganda um, and traveled with Wes, you know, we all were writers. We went there to help spread the word about children living in poverty in Uganda and to try to get um, people to sponsor um, sponsor the children through Compassion's program, which I love, by the way. Um, but Wes went with us and we were all, you know, we had our phones to take photos and um, to sort of our notebooks to take notes on, but Wes came empty handed. Every time we would go visit a compassion site and go visit some children, some sponsored children, he always came empty handed. He didn't carry his phone, he didn't carry a camera, he didn't carry a notebook. And he would get off that bus and the children would come running. Sometimes they would come with a song or something to share and Wes would, would touch every child and he would touch their head and he would look them in the eye. Sometimes he would stoop down to their level. And I just thought, wow, that's really lovely that he was um, fully present um, with those children. And he looked them in the eye and he saw their value. And he would never say, now hurry up and grow up because that's, that's when you're gonna really make a difference in the world. But he recognized, um, he recognized their importance right where they were as little children. And I think that's what Christ does for us, that he takes our, hand, our faces in his hand and he says, you don't need to grow up. You just need to hang on to me. Um, earlier yesterday, actually, I shared a quote on Instagram that sometimes when I'm so desperately longing for a map, uh, Christ offers me his hand instead. And I think that's what our soul longs for. I think that's what in the invisible place where whatever you want to call it, if you call it your spirit, your soul, or a hybrid of both, we know that there's an invisible and in that sacred invisible place um, where we connect with God and understand ourselves. Uh, when we take his hand and allow ourselves to be fully present with him, um, I think really beautiful things can happen. Really freeing, beautiful things can begin to happen. Um, I just want to end with two things. One is a quote from John Ortberg from his book, Soul Keeping. And he says this, he said, if your soul is healthy, no external circumstance can destroy your life. If your soul is unhealthy, no external circumstance can redeem your life. I think so often um, that's what we're trying to do is we're trying to wrap our soul around something that uh, we weren't meant to get life from. And so it's only when we, when we recognize our soul centers around Christ that we will be satisfied. Um, well, like I said, I'm so thankful that you've joined me for these lunchtime scopes on the East Coast or wherever you are in the world, whether you're watching live or on the replay. Um, this is the book we've been talking about, Simply Tuesday, Small Moment Living in a Fast-Moving World. Um, it's a book I wrote for us, for anyone who feels like their soul has been held hostage by hustle. Thank you for those of you who've joined us each week. Thank you for those of you who have joined us for the first time. I invite you back next week, same time, same place. Um, if you wanted to do more study and understand and kind of come up with your own definition of the soul, if, if some of this you're like, I don't know, um, I'm just gonna give you some people that I've looked to uh, to sort of help me understand and process. And like I, I mentioned John Ortberg's book, Soul Keeping. Um, also David Binner is a good one, Dr. Larry Crabb, Ruth Haley Barton, Major Ian Thomas, so good, his stuff's so good. Greg Smith and Dan Stone um, wrote a great book together. And then Andrew Murray are some people who have, I have really looked to, some authors who have helped to shape my own views and understandings of the soul and, and the invisible um, human. So again, thank you for joining us. If you had, a, if, you, if you just caught the end of this, 
you can watch the replay on Periscope for 24 hours. And also we will put up this replay at encourage.me with an I, encourage, not me with an I, encourage with an I, um, by Thursday. So thanks so much. Uh, love having you guys here. Yay.